Praise the Lord. This is Brother Harlan Tarrant Sr. Getting ready to continue our Bible study today on the great book of Daniel. Uh, we're in uh, chapter 11 where we left off the last time, the beginning of chapter 11. This is a very historical chapter and a very long chapter. The history from Darius to the future Antichrist is revealed in this 11th chapter. Five years before Gabriel had helped Michael overthrow the Satanic forces over Babylon so that the Prince of Persia might come. Also, I in the first year of Darius the Mede, even I stood in to confirm and to strengthen him. And now will I show thee the truth. Behold, there shall stand up yet three kings in Persia, and the fourth shall be far richer than they all, and by his strength, through his riches, he shall stir up all the all against the realm of Grisha. In uh, the previous tape, uh, tape number three, uh, reveals who these kings were in history. And a mighty king shall stand up, this is Alexander the Great, by the way, and shall rule with great dominion and do according to his will the visions of Greece into four kingdoms. And when he shall stand up, his kingdom shall be broken and shall be divided toward the four winds of heaven and not to his posterity, nor according to his dominion, which he ruled, for his kingdom shall be plucked up, even for others beside those. And the king of the south shall be strong, and one of his princes he shall be strong above him, and shall have dominion, and his dominion shall be a great dominion. The king of the south was Ptolemy, uh, Lagaday, uh, one of Alexander's generals who seized Egypt on the death of Alexander. King of the north was Seleucus I, one of Alexander's princes, and a general who seized Syria, Babylon, and Media, and became greater than Ptolemy of Egypt. The league between Egypt and Syria, the south and the north, through the marriage of Bernice, Bernice, Bear, I'm sorry, Berenice, the daughter of Ptolemy of uh, Philadelphus, to Antiochus Theos, third king of Syria. And in the end of years they shall join together themselves together, for the king's daughter of the south shall come to the king of the north to make an agreement, but she shall not retain the power of the arm, neither shall he stand nor his arm, but she shall be given up, and they that brought her, and he that begat her, and he that strengthened her in these times. The branch of her roots, a brother of a nurse Berenice, Ptolemy uh, Eurogates, who invaded Syria, the north, to avenge the murder of Berenice by Laodicea, who was divorced by Antica so he could marry Berenice. But out of a branch of her root shall one stand up in his estate, and shall come with an army, and shall enter into the fortress of the king of the north, and shall deal against them, and shall prevail, and also shall also carry captives into Egypt, their gods with their princes, and with their precious vessels of silver and gold, and he shall continue, continue more years than the king of the north. So the king of the south shall come into his kingdom, and shall return to his own land. The defeat of Antiochus the Great by Ptolemy the Third of Egypt the south. But his son shall be stirred up, and shall assemble a multitude of great forces, and one shall certainly come and overflow and pass through, then shall he return and be stirred up even to the fortress, to his fortress. And the king of the south shall be moved with choler, and shall come forth and fight with him, even with the king of the north, and he shall set forth a great multitude, but the multitude shall be given into his hand. And when he hath taken away the multitude, his heart shall be lifted up, and he shall cast down many ten thousands, but he shall not be strengthened by it. Antiochus the Great of Syria, the north, renews the war after fourteen years, and defeats Ptolemy V uh, of Egypt in the south. But the king of the north shall return, and shall set forth a multitude greater than the former, and shall certainly come after certain years with a great army and with much riches. And in those times there shall uh, many stand up against the king of the south, also the robbers of thy people shall exalt themselves to establish the vision, but they shall fall. 
So the king of the north shall come and cast up a mount and take the most fenced cities, and the arms of the south shall not withstand, neither his chosen people, neither uh, shall there be any strength to withstand. But he that cometh against him shall do according to his own will, and none shall stand before him, and he shall stand in the glorious land, which by his hand shall be consumed. Antichus the Great and Ptolemy the Fifth come to terms. Antichus gives Ptolemy his daughter, who later helps her husband defeat the plans of Antichus. He shall also set his face to enter with the strength of his whole kingdom, and upright ones with him, thus shall he do. And he shall give him the daughter of women, corrupting her, but she shall not stand on her side, on his side, rather, uh, neither be for him. Antichus next makes war on Greece, but is turned back by the Roman prince, uh, S-C-I-P-I-O, who defeats him at Magnesia near Smyrna. And after this shall he turn his face into the isles, and shall take away, but a prince for, or take many, but a prince for his own behalf shall cause the reproach offered by him to cease. Without his own reproach he shall cause it to turn upon him. Then he shall turn his face toward the fort of his own land, but he shall stumble and fall and not be found. Now this refers to Antiochus the Great turning back to his own fort in Antioch. He was obliged to raise 15,000 talents for Rome to pay for the war. He marched into his eastern provinces to exact the uh, unpaid taxes and perished in a war in Luristan in 187 BC. Seleucus, the son of Antiochus the Great, sends uh, H E L I O D O R U S to plunder the temple at Jerusalem and exact many uh, money from Israel. Second uh, Maccabees 3 verse 4. This king is soon poisoned and is succeeded by Antiochus Epiphanes. Then shall stand up in his estate a raiser of taxes, and in the glory of his kingdom, uh, but with a, in a few days he shall be destroyed, neither in anger, anger nor in battle. And this raiser of taxes, according to Dr. Dake, is Seleucus IV, was called a raiser of taxes because he was compelled to pay a yearly war indemnity exacted by Rome. He raised money from many new sources, even sending his minister, uh, H-E-L-I-D-O-R-U-S to Jerusalem to plunder the temple. Seleucius IV was assassinated by Halodorus, who sought to be king. Antiochus Epiphanes and his dealings with Israel are pictured in 11, 21 through 34. He obtains his rule by flattery. And in his estate shall stand up a vile person to whom they shall not give the honor of the kingdom, but he shall come in peaceably and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. He makes league with the high priest, deals deceitfully, and becomes strong. And with the arms of a flood shall they be overflown before, from before him, and shall be broken, yea, also the prince of the covenant. Now this prince of the covenant here, not only were his competitors overthrown, but the high priest Onias was disposed, and Jason, who had given him a great sum of money was installed in his place, Second Maccabees 4, verse 4 through 10. And after the league made with him, he shall work deceitfully, for he shall come up and shall become strong with a small people. He shall enter peaceably even upon the fattest places of the province, and he shall do that which his fathers have not done, nor his father's fathers. He shall scatter among them the prey and spoil and riches, yea, and he shall forecast his devices against the strongholds even for a time. Antiochus planned in various ways to prevent an invasion of his kingdom by Egypt and strengthen the strongholds of defense on his northern borders or his borders while making preparation for war on Egypt. This he did for a time. Makes war against Ptolemy of Egypt who is betrayed and killed and his army defeated. And he uh, shall stir up his power and his courage against the king of the south with a great army, and the king of the south shall be stirred up to battle with a very great and mighty army, but he shall not stand, for they shall forecast devices against him. Yea, they, sh they that feed of the portion of his meat shall destroy him, and his army shall overflow, and many shall fall down slain. And both these kings' hearts shall be to do mischief, and they shall speak lies at one table, but it shall not prosper 
for yet the end shall be at the time appointed. And Antichus returns in glory and victory and sets his heart to break the Jewish covenant and plunder Palestine. Then shall he return into his land with great riches, and his heart shall be against the holy covenant, and he shall do exploits and return to his own land. And he leads a second expedition into Egypt, but is turned back by a mandate from Rome in league with Cyrus. Cyprus. He then turns against the Jews, and many apostate Jews help him to pollute the temple and place the abomination of desolation, a sow, on the temple altar and doing away with the Jewish sacrifices. And at the time appointed he shall return and come toward the south, uh, but it shall not be as the former or as the latter, for the ships of Shechem uh, shall come against him, therefore he shall be grieved and return and have indignation against the holy covenant, and so shall he do. He shall even return and have intelligence with them that forsake the holy covenant, and arms shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and shall take away the daily sacrifice. They shall place the abomination that maketh desolate. And he is resisted by the Maccabees, who do export, but are oppressed by him many days. And such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he corrupt by flatteries. But the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. And they that understand among the people shall instruct many, yet uh, they shall fall by the sword and by flame, by captivity, and by spoil many days. And when they shall fall, they shall be hoping with a little help, but many shall cleave to them with flatteries. The war between Syria and Egypt in the last days, a prophetic description of the last king of the north, the Antichrist, and his conquest of the nations, and his dealing with Israel, the time of the vision. And some of them of understanding shall fall to trial them and to purge, and to make them white, even to the time of the end, because it is yet for a time appointed, the character of the king of the north. Uh, see chapter 7, verse 25, and 8, verse 25. And the king shall do according to his will, and he shall magnify, exalt himself, and magnify himself above every god, and shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods, and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished, for that that is determined shall be done. Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any God, for he shall magnify himself above all. But in his estate shall he honor the God of forces, and a God whom his fathers knew not shall he honor with gold and silver, and with precious stones and pleasant things. Thus shall he do in the most strongholds with a strange God, whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory, and he shall cause them to rule over many and shall divide the gain, the land for gain. Then we have war between Syria, the north, and Egypt, the south, at the end time, Antichrist, the Syria of the north, and Syria is victorious over Egypt, the south, and many countries uh, up to the middle of Daniel's 70th week when the eighth, or revived, Grecian empire is formed. See uh, Daniel 7, 24, 8, 23 through 25, Revelation 11, verse 7, 13, 1 through 18, 16, 10, 17, 3, and then 8 through 14, 16, 17, and 19, and 19 through 21. And at the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots and with horsemen and with many ships, and he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. He shall enter also into the glorious land, and many countries shall be overthrown. But these shall escape out of his hand, even Edom and Moab, and the chief of the children of Ammon. He shall stretch forth his hand also upon the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. But he shall have power over the treasures of gold and of silver, and over all the precious things of Egypt. And the Libyans and the Ethiopians shall be at his steps. New adversaries in the north and east, in the middle of the week after he has conquered the red conquer and gotten control of the ten kingdoms of revised Rome. He conquers these in the last ten and one half years, then brings them into Palestine to destroy Israel as he intended to do in the middle of the week when he broke his covenant with them and planted his tabernacle in the glorious holy mountain. See Second Thessalonians chapter two verse three and four, Matthew twenty four, fifteen through twenty two. But tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him, therefore he shall go forth with great fury to destroy and to utterly make away many. 
when he sets up his uh, throne in the Jewish temple at Jerusalem. Uh, 2 Thessalonians, of course, chapter 2, verse 4, uh, Daniel 7, 25, Daniel 8, 25. And he shall plant the tabernacle of his palace between the sea and the glorious holy mountain, yet he shall come to his end, and none shall help him. And uh, that's the 11th chapter of Daniel. And uh, we'd like to read what this old gentleman said here. Most of this uh, 11th chapter is history, and some of it is prophetic. But this old gentleman here uh, thinks that most of it, or a lot of it, is uh, future. So we're going to see his viewpoints. The Persians conquered. This 11th chapter of Daniel is the most difficult to understand because it reaches from the time of Darius the Mede through the coming of the Antichrist and through to the end of his career. And now I will show thee the truth. Behold, there shall stand up yet three kings in Persia, and the fourth shall be far richer than they all, and by his strength through his riches he shall stir up all against the realm of Grecia. 11 verse 2. Uh, there were to be four Persian kings, three to follow Darius, who was a Mede. Daniel did not live much longer after the termination of his visions, for when God is through with a servant, he takes him to heaven. He will let that servant live until he is through with him, even though his life may be extended longer than that of Daniel. After these three kings in Persia, the third empire came into existence named Greece. Regarding the first king, he states, A mighty king shall stand up, uh, shall rule with great dominion, and do according to his will. That mighty king, as we have seen in another article, was Alexander the Great. This mighty conqueror who destroyed the Medo-Persian kingdom died very young. After his death, his kingdom was divided between his four army generals rather than going to any of his kin, which was the general rule in the genealogies of kings. Uh, and when he shall stand up, his kingdom shall be broken and shall be divided toward the four winds of heaven and not to his posterity, nor according to his dominion which he ruled, for his kingdom shall be plucked up even for others beside those. From this verse to the end of the 18th, we have a brief history of the nations bearing the rule over the Gentile world during all of their battles and struggles, including that of the Roman Empire. This would make an interesting study for all those who love history. However, we do not wish to concern ourselves with anything but that which is directly connected with future prophecy. Meanwhile, the Jews remain in Palestine under the rule of the Gentile nations until after the crucifixion of Jesus and for 37 years thereafter. Then they were dispersed into all the nations of the world, for they remain until the First World War. From the 19th verse to the end of the chapter, we have the prophecy of the rise and career of the personal Antichrist, and that is what God wants to get to our hearts and minds for our time. The Ottoman Empire fell. In this chapter, we may have centuries of history bound up in one short verse. Verse 19 is like that, for it speaks about the end of the Ottoman Empire, which had the land of promise under its dominion for at least 13 centuries. Now, in its fall by force of arms, one of the great prophecies fulfilled during the prophetic First World War was accomplished. Then shall he turn his face toward the fort of his own land, and uh, but he shall stumble and fall and not be found. And this is found in verse 19. And now uh, this old gentleman says that this right here is the Ottoman Empire. And uh, we read here that this refers to Antiochus the Great returning back to his own fort in Antioch. He was obliged to raise 15,000 talents for Rome to pay for the war. He marched into his eastern province to exact the unpaid taxes and perished in a war in uh, Luristan in 187 B.C. So... Uh, this gentleman, Mr. Dakes, says that that is uh, uh, the uh, Antichrist the Great, and this old gentleman says it's the uh, Ottoman Empire. During the decade before the First World War, when the nations were closing, choosing up sides, England had a treaty with Turkey. The British knew that Germany wanted to control all the Middle East. They foresaw that when the war came and when Germany was successful in conquering France and breaking out into the Mediterranean Sea, she would seek to destroy the Ottoman Empire, which was weak by going up through the Dardanelles and taking Constantinople, the capital. To prevent this, England was permitted to build the fortifications on the strait. At this entrance, there are high cliffs on the south mainland, and this British engineer blasted out a fort and equipped it with heavy arms so that a German fleet would not dare to enter the strait. 
During the war, when Turkey saw that the Germans were gaining and were shelling the outskirts of Paris, believing that Germany would be the victory in the war, uh, she tore up her treaty with England and entered in the war on the side of Germany. This was her great blunder, but God was in it. Now England had another foe to fight. She was not too perturbed about it, for now she felt that the Ottoman Empire would fall before her. Often great leaders make great mistakes, and Britain, under the leadership of Winston Churchill, sent their navy in a great armed force to take the capital city, but her first task was to take the fortifications of the Dardanelles. Here they lost 600,000 men and were still unable to take the city. Uh, I talked to two British soldiers who were in the expedition. They told me of boys who had gone ashore under cover of darkness only to be unable to accomplish anything or to return because of the withering uh, fire from the forts above them. When they ran out uh, of water, the great many of them died of uh, thirst with tongues swollen and hanging out of their mouths and some going insane before death relieved them of their torments. Jerusalem taken. Seeing the futility of their efforts to take the fortification they had built against themselves rather than the Germans, the British decided to withdraw and invade Turkey by way of the east through the desert and to take Jerusalem first. The night of their withdrawal, God sent a covering fog and they withdrew without the slightest loss. When the fog lifted, the Turks wondered what had become of their enemy, for not a ship or a soldier were to be seen. They waited for days, thinking the British would return. Uh, when they finally realized that the British had changed their point of attack and that Jerusalem was about to be taken, they turned their face toward the fort of their own land, but it was too late. The British were already at the uh, fast closed gates of Jerusalem. The city was sacred to many religions and they did not want to devastate it. After praying and hesitating for three days, during which small aircraft were sent over the city, dropping leaflets, asking people to surrender, assuring all that no one would be executed or molested. White flags appeared on the walls and rooftops. The gates were uh, open, and General Allenby and his officers walked in bare-handed and took the city without firing a shot. The war with Turkey ended. The Turks surely stumbled and fell and have no longer been found in possession of the Holy Land. This was the greatest prophetic fulfillment since the birth of Jesus and God's main objective in the First World War was the liberation of Palestine from Turkish rule. And uh, that scripture returned it, is their face toward the fort of their own land. And uh, I'd like to see that. Uh, praise God. Let's see what this gentleman here has to say about it. Glory to God. This is uh, let's see chapter eleven. Thank God. Turn his face toward the fort of his own land. He shall be in a few days. He shall be destroyed, and not in anger nor in battle. Yeah, that's what this uh, gentleman says here. The Mr. Date we just read it refers to Antiochus the Great, the British Mandate. Then shall stand up in his estate a raise of taxes in the glory of his kingdom, but within a few days he shall be destroyed, neither in anger nor in battle. This is in verse 20 of chapter 11. This verse is easily understood under the Balfour Declaration. Uh, the Jews were given Palestine as a national homeland, and after the end of the war, Jews from all parts of the world began to return home. The League of Nations gave Britain the mandate over the land, and she held it for 30 years. During that time, Jewish immigration was limited to a certain number from, uh, every month. This was done so that the incoming Jews could build a sound economy and to avoid greater objections from the Arabs. Land had to be acquired for a price from Arabs willing to sell. Most of them were willing to accept a higher price than they could get from others, and until 1948, all the land for farms and buildings were bought and paid for by the Jews. Not until after the British mandate was ended and the defeat of the Arabs who came in by force of arms to drive out the hated Jews did the Jews take over the land and property owned by the Arabs without paying for it. The razor of taxes in the glory of the kingdom was definitely England. And that's according to what this old gentleman says here. Uh, verse 20, the razor of taxes in his own land, so forth. Uh, Seleucius IV was called a razor of taxes because he was compelled to pay a yearly 
war indemnity exacted by Rome. He raised money from many new sources, even sending his minister, uh, Heliodorus, to Jerusalem to plunder the temple. Seleucius IV was assassinated by Hel Heliodorus, who sought to be king. So Mr. Dake says that that uh, a raiser of taxes is Seleucius IV. And Mr. Uh, Burns here says that that was England. Glory to God. The First World War started an evolving chain reaction in the fulfillment of thousands of scriptural statements regarding the regathering of the twelve tribes of Israel from every nation on earth. It was as if the signs of Jesus' near coming had been written in blood red letters across the eastern sky of an approaching new prophetic day. The blackest days of tribulation, suffering, and judgment poured upon the wicked of this world are an encouragement to all the blood washed to look up and lift up our heads for your redemption draweth nigh uh, Luke 21 verse 28 for 20 years I used the scripture in Daniel's prophecy to prove that the British would have to surrender their mandate to Palestine the, the inference is that she would not be forced out of by any national enemy but that she would give it up willingly for the British were to give it up within a few days or years neither in anger nor in battle that is in verse 20 uh, he shall be destroyed neither in anger nor in battle. And according to Mr. Dake, this refers to the manner of death of Seleucus IV, not in anger and not in battle, fighting with the enemy, but uh, basely and treacherously assassinated by one in whom he trusted. He died of poison. Glory to God. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Uh, and my uh, good brother George, who had accepted the British Israel theory, wrote me after he had an article in one of the first issues of the Midnight Cry stating that Britain would never give up Palestine. He cut uh, two news items from the Toronto, Ontario papers which stated that the British were planning to make Palestine a crown colony. He stated that when John Bull gets hold of any country he never lets go. He advised me to retract my statements while I could for to take back water uh, would uh, be humiliating indeed. I wrote him in a few weeks re reaffirming my position and told him that according to all that could be found in the word, Britain would never produce a personal antichrist and that she would either have to do this or surrender Palestine. After a few weeks of consideration, he answered my letter saying that perhaps I was right. This scripture is too plainly stated and to disregard this fact. And I love this stuff that Mr. Dake uh, gives us as historical and this Mr. Burns is putting this stuff, like I said, in the beginning of this chapter in a future tense. And this right here, of course, is history as far as we're concerned now. I was in Britain years after my precious brother had slipped away to heaven. I was preaching in a great hall in Cardiff, Wales, on the night of May 14, 1948, and had a wonderful time preaching to about 700 people. That night, at the stroke of midnight, British officials in Jerusalem pulled down the Union Jack and ended their mandate over Palestine. A nation born in a day. This was one of the greatest proph prophetic dates up to that time in the fulfillment of end time prophecy. It is a date we should never forget for on that night at the stroke of twelve a new nation was born, born in a day, and that nation was Israel. The very moment Dr. Chain Wiseman and Dr. Ben Gurion came before microphones in the national radio hookup and announced the rebirth of Israel as a nation. They said that after nearly 2,000 years of wandering and without a national government, the Jews were once more a nation. The provisional government uh, soon became the official government. The doors of Jewish immigration were thrown wide open, and any Jew from any country in the world was welcome to come home and urged to come home. Today, nearly three million Jews at the time of the writing of this book uh, had returned to Israel, and they are returning still rapidly. The land is suffering growing pains. After the announcement of the creation of the nation of Israel, the young people and many of the older ones took to the streets and danced for joy until the early morning hours. At that very time, four Arab armies marched into the land with the great threat of driving the Jews into the sea, but God fought for them as in days of old. The Arabs were whipped to a standstill and signed an agreement of peace. That short six weeks was attended by many divine miracles, miracles as great as anything you will find in the entire ancient Bible. Verse 19 and 20 of Daniel 11 are now history. Of this very event the prophet wrote, Shall the nation and shall the earth be made to bring forth in one day, or shall a nation be born at once? 
uh, or shall a nation be born in a day? Isaiah 66 verse 7 through 9 indicates that the nation of Israel would be born in one day. It was exactly at midnight, May 14, 1948, and this prophecy reached a full and complete fulfillment. All Bible prophecy will be fulfilled to the very letter. Many end time facets of Bible prophecy are being fulfilled before our eyes now and herald the return of Jesus Christ in our generation. Yet the world does not recognize the signs of his coming. And um, I'd like to see Isaiah chapter 66, verse 7 through 9. And I'd like to see what, uh, if Mr. Dake has anything to say about that, give you his opinion. And Isaiah chapter 66, verse 7 through 9. Glory, hallelujah. Before she travailed, she brought forth. Before her uh, pain came, she was delivered of a man child. Uh, who hath heard such a thing? Who has seen such things? She Shall the earth be made to bring forth in one day, or shall a nation be born at once? For as soon as Zion prevailed, she brought forth her children. Shall I bring to the birth, and not cause to bring forth, saith the Lord? And shall I cause to bring forth, saith the Lord, and shut up the womb, saith thy God? And uh, I'd like to read you some of these uh, uh, verses here in the comments of Mr. Dake. These verses 7 through 9 predict the travail of Israel in the last days under the Antichrist. Two future travails of Israel. The first travail of Israel will be when she brings forth the man child, the 144,000 Jews in Revelation chapter 7, verse 1 through 8, where they're sealed. And then chapter 12, verse 5 and 6, and verse 14, where they are raptured and where they're seen with Jesus Christ, the 24 elders, and the four living creatures on Re Revelation 14, verse 1 through 5, and Daniel chapter 12, 1. The second travail will be for herself to be delivered from the Antichrist and the armies of the nations at the end of the future tribulation. See Jack Zechariah chapter 14 and Revelation 19, verse 11 through 21. Before this experience, she will travail for the man, child, and bring him forth. Daniel 12, 1. Uh, Revelation 5, about 12, verse 5 and 6, and 14, 1 through 5, and so forth. Then, about three and one half years later, she will travail for herself to be delivered and be born again in a day. Zechariah 12, 10 through 13, 1, and uh, 13, verse 9. Uh, the Lord shall be king over all the earth, and in that day there shall be one Lord in his name, one. And uh, then, of course, Zechariah 14, 1 through 5, or the 1 through 15 where that uh, Jesus comes back to the Mount of Olives with ten thousands of his saints and mountain splits, etc. Revelation 19, 11 through 21 shows this battle of Armageddon and him coming back to reign for a thousand years. Zechariah 12, verse 10 speaks of uh, the repentance and pouring out his spirit upon the house of Israel and them repenting and uh, looking up on him whom they have pierced and it gives the tribes that, that repent. And then Zechariah 13, 1 talks about the fountain being open to the house of David for sin and uncleanness. Then the man child here is the same as in the Revelation chapter 12 verse 5 the 144,000 saved Jews of the first three and one half years of Daniel's 70th week. The earth bringing forth in one day and the nation being born at once referred to the conversion by God of the remnant of Israel, the ones left in Palestine after the tribulation. Now if you'll remember uh, we just uh, gave you those statistics there in Zechariah chapter 12 verse 10 through 13 verse 1 where that they repent and they turn to God with their whole heart and uh, they re they have, they're in travail and they bring forth a man child and the remnant of her seed is made war upon by uh, Satan and the Antichrist of course and she goes into the wilderness for the last three and one half years of this age where she has a place prepared by God that they should feed her there a thousand uh, 203 score days or the last three and a half years of this age. It's also found in uh, Romans chapter 11 verse 25 through 29. God asks the question, or Paul does, shall, hath God cast away his people whom he foreknew? God forbid. And God's going to send a deliverer out of Zion or out of Jacob and he's going to turn uh, the hearts of Israel and so forth and then Israel's going to be saved. All right. The character and career of the Antichrist. From this verse to the end of the chapter, we have portrayed the character and career of the personal Antichrist. Each 
uh, event in his reign follows consecutively. Uh, therefore, no words can possibly refer to anything else in history, in, even including anyone who has been considered a type of that coming Superman. And of course, as we have said before here with Mr. Dake, uh, he uh, teaches that uh, Antichus Epiphanes did do those very things, breaking the covenant and so forth. Uh, not breaking the covenant, but, but going into the holy uh, place in the temple and setting up uh, some type of a sow on the altar and so forth. In his estate shall stand up a vile person. There are multitudes of vile persons in leadership among the nations of the earth, but prophecy here deals with only one vile person, and he is that one uh, which is yet to appear, the personal Antichrist. This statement includes a reference to the preceding verse in which is expressed that the nation who administered the mandate over Israel is destroyed neither in anger nor in battle. That verse indicates that that nation mandatory power over Israel was destroyed or done away with neither in anger nor in battle. As we have mentioned before, the British mandate ended at midnight, May 14, 1948. At that same time, the new state of Israel came into being. You will notice that the vile person does not receive the honor of the kingdom, but he shall come in peaceably and obtain the kingdom by flattery. Verse 21, uh, last clause. To receive the honor of the kingdom, the personal antichrist, the vile person, would have to fight against the land of Palestine and take it. He does not receive his power over this little nation that way. Great Britain fought for the near eastern countries and lost more than half a million men in the conflict but was given only the mandate over Palestine. It is evident from the scripture that the personal antichrist is a political figure in the beginning of his career. No prophecy regarding this great personage describes him as a warrior conquering country after country to establish his kingdom which covers the entire territory of the old Roman Empire. Uh, he is the rider on the white horse in the first seal, Revelation chapter 6. Here he goes forth to conquer the whole world by peaceful methods but prepared if necessary to plunge the world into a revolution to create that world government. He destroys many by his uh, offers and programs of peace. It is only after the rapture of the bride of Christ that he turns to the use of arms. There is a period of time between the surrender of the British mandate and the time when the Antichrist comes in peaceably and obtains the kingdom by flatteries. It is quite evident also that when he gets possession, it does not come by the permission of Israel or the will of their national leaders. This is seen by the fact that after he gets control of Israel peaceably to establish himself in power, he uses force. And with the arms of a flood shall they be overflown from before him, and shall be broken, yea, also the prince of the covenant. Verse 22. Here is the first mention of the covenant in this chapter. This covenant has to be the Abrahamic covenant, for David, or for Daniel earlier states that he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. Daniel 9.27. The Antichrist is therefore established as a leader and comes into prominence by his diplomatic genius in settling some of trouble in the Middle East between the Jews and the Arabs. To do this, he has armies under his command. He may not have to use force, but only given a great show of force, which uh, may be under the United Nations or its successor. Certain great events are rapidly shaping in the Middle East. It is quite evident that the vile person the Antichrist will first put in his appearance and rise to the prominence among the world leaders in the Middle East as Daniel states. And after the league made with him, he shall work deceitfully, for he shall come up and shall become strong with a small people. Verse 23. In order to make such a league, he has to be on the earth in the appearance of a man, but with superintelligence and statesmanship ability. He will have the appearance of a flesh and blood individual, and yet the Bible plainly declares that he is a resurrected being, for he ascends out of the bottomless pit, and at the end of his career he goes into perdition. Revelation 18, verse 8. And Dr. Dake says that this is the spirit uh, of, that went into the bottomless pit that's going to come out and possess some human being. And uh, this man here says that it's Nimrod, which was, uh, built the first tower of Babel, or Babylon, and, uh, and then uh, he comes up out of the bottomless pit, and a false prophet also. So uh, you can just ponder these thoughts. Regardless of what happens to him, even to the receiving a deadly wound by the sword, he will still live. He is not vile, that is, morally despicable, because he comes out of the bottomless pit, but because when he lived on this earth, he had reached a place where he was so possessed by the devil, he could not become more corrupt. 
the cup of iniquity was of his iniquity was full. And I would like to say this: some people uh, think that Judas Iscariot will be the Antichrist because he is called the son of perdition, and the Antichrist is called the son of perdition. So uh, no other two people in the Bible were called the son of perdition. It is near, nearly time for the Antichrist to appear. It will pay to watch the Middle East carefully, for some leader will make a league of some description uh, which will tend toward peace. After this league, his satanic nature will manifest itself, for he shall work deceitfully. This type of deception is often labeled diplomacy, but it is that which the world likes. So when they need a president for the United States of Europe, they will offer him the position, his administration. From verse 24 to the end of the chapter, we are given a glimpse into the character and forays of the Antichrist until the end of his career. Some of these highlights are worthy of note. He shall enter peaceably even upon the fattest places of the province. He will start out small and through his benevolent practices he will set himself up in the goodwill of the common people. One thing the Antichrist will constantly keep before the people is his peace program, but those programs are deceiving. In any battle, and a spoil is taken. Uh, he shall scatter among them the prey and spoil and riches. He will take from the rich and give to the poor. This is a claim the communist leaders have always made, but never did so. But this man actually does fulfill this promise to the people and thus wins their confidence. After the rapture of the bride of Christ will be the tribulation, a severe time of revolution. Here the kings of the south comes into conflict with the Antichrist with a great army, and multitudes are slain with no definite accomplishment or for or against either side. This may be over some problem in the Middle East. We are told in Daniel that after the beast kingdom is formed, three of the ten nations seek to secede from the Federation, but this is prevented by the Antichrist. Verse 27 uh, states that both of these kings, the king of the south and the personal Antichrist, purpose to do mischief and to call for a conference, but they shall speak lies at one table. The military struggle ends for the time being in favor of the personal antichrist, but the verse states that it shall not prosper, for yet the end shall be at the time appointed. And there is a set time in the calendar of God for the tribulation to run its course, and for the arrest of the beast and the false prophet, at which time they will be cast or flung violently into that lake of fire called perdition. After the rapture of the bride of Christ, the seal book will be opened, and the four horses of the apocalypse will go forth. This is the war to bring about the World Federation under the leadership of the Antichrist. All this is briefly given between verses 21 and 27. It is during this time that his heart shall be against the Holy Covenant. This covenant which is called the Holy is the Abrahamic Covenant, which is the Antichrist confirms with Israel the first day of the Covenant week of Daniel. God's covenants are always holy, even though the Antichrist uses this covenant to establish himself as the Jews Messiah, it is still holy. Trouble within the kingdom. The beast kingdom is very powerful, yet trouble never ceases from its formation to the very end. This is seen in the fact that the ten toes on the great image of Daniel chapter 2 are part of iron and part of clay. Because of this, Daniel states, the kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it of the strength of iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay, and as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. Daniel chapter 2, verse 41 through 43. Now this interpretation by Daniel of the great image makes it clear that the beast kingdom, all the way through the great tribulation, will have serious trouble. It will have to do like Russia does when one of the states tries to gain more freedom as Hungary and Czechoslovakia tried to do uh, but were kept in subjection by military force. This is why we see in the 11th chapter a description of the weakness of the beast kingdom even though it is described as a strong beast in other places. Verse 29 and 30 shows another phase of the trouble between the king of the south and the antichrist. Again he makes an effort to subdue the king of the south but this time the ships of Shedom, England, Come against him. When this member of this kingdom makes this move, he is grieved but thinks it best not to aggravate any more uh, any other power in his federation and so returns and has indignation against the Holy Covenant. This is the second time the Holy Covenant is mentioned. 
forsaking the covenant. We must remember that the 144,000 sealed ones in Israel will be exerting a powerful influence for righteousness during their ministry from the time that they are sealed to the time that they are translated to heaven in the very middle of the covenant week. Greatly indignant and uh, determined to do something about the problem, he has intelligence with those among the Jews who forsake the Holy Covenant. From the time uh, the sacrifices are renewed in the rebuilt temple in Jerusalem, there will be those in Israel who will be dissatisfied and will be willing to side with the Antichrist to overthrow the sacrifices. He shall have tel intelligence with them that forsake the Holy Covenant. Then the Antichrist goes into action, and arms shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and shall take away the daily sacrifice, and they shall place the abomination that make it desolate. Daniel 11, verse 30 and 31. This placing of the abomination of, uh, that make it desolate is that to which Jesus referred to in his Olivet Discourse. When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place, whosoever readeth, let him understand, then let them which be in Judea flee to the mountains. This is Matthew 24, starting at verse 15, going to uh, verse 22. This abomination that make it desolate is the image of the Antichrist, which is placed in the temple at Jerusalem, after the daily sacrifices are made to cease. This takes place directly in the middle of the seven-year period of tribulation, extending from the signing of the covenant to the gathering for Armageddon. It is the length of time of the reign of the beast over a world government. This is stated in Revelation 13 to be a period of 42 months. We get, through, uh, we get enough in prophecy to reveal the terrible turmoil in Israel at the time the daily sacrifices are uh, taken away. Jews oppose Jews and events leading up to the overthrow of the sacrifices. Others will jealously guard the right to continue the sacrifices. It is at this visit to the scene of trouble that the Antichrist receives a deadly wound by the sword and still lives so that the world wonders after the beast. It is here that Paul states, He that as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 4. Is it any wonder that the world wonders after him and freely worships him as God? The fierce conflict of controversy between the two factions of Jews is seen in verse 32. And such as do wickedly against the covenant shall be he corrupt by flatteries. The Antichrist will take advantage of this quarrel. He will flatter those who want the sacrifices to cease and offer reward for their brave stand. He will be irked by the sacrifices for he will be anxious for the time to come when he alone would be worshipped. Many leaders in Israel will become aware of the deception and will recognize that he is not their Messiah but is an imposter. God will endow many with the spirit of understanding. They will be people that do know their God and it is stated they will instruct many. They will be strong and do exploits. Now, this uh, will not be tolerated for long by the Antichrist government. It will not take long to institute the mark of the beast, for his full responsibility for this will be placed in the hands of the apostate world church, the mystery Babylon the uh, Great, uh, and the mother of Hollis. The false prophet will put the program in motion to execute all who refuse the mark and refuse to worship the Antichrist as God. The darkest days. Daniel tells us they shall fall by the sword, by the flame, or burned at the stake, by captivity, concentration, camps with death, by slow torture, and by spoil many days. Verse 33, it cannot be longer than three and a half years under the severe persecution. We, When they shall fall, they shall be helped with a little help and encouragement by devout friends. Those are the ones who will be preserved to go into the millennial kingdom. Uh, these are the ones to whom Christ says in his account of the judgment of the nations in Matthew chapter 25, verse 31 through 46. Come, you blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was a hunger, and you gave me meat. And I was a stranger, and you took me in, and so forth. And I was naked, and you clothed me, and I was sick and in prison, and you visited me. And they'll ask him, when do we see the hunger, the thirst, and so forth, administered unto thee? And he will say, uh, in so much as you've done in one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it unto me. And these will be the darkest days and the most distressing spiritually, yet, but yet the most fruitful in the salvation of soul, because all will be forced to accept the Antichrist, receive his mark, and be lost, or reject the mark and be saved. Multitudes will prefer to be saved regardless of the cost. 
and some of them of understanding shall fall to trial them and to purge and to make them white even to the time of the end because it is yet for a time appointed. Verse 35. I do not believe that those who fall among the leaders compromise with the world church but rather accept their punishment for instructing the people much like it is done uh, now behind the iron curtain. All suffering for Christ does purge, purify, and make white. You will notice that it is stated that the time of the end is an appointed time. Like all events in the redemption of mankind, God has a calendar and uh, with specific dates to be fulfilled. The end will not come one day sooner than God has appointed and not one day later. And this is clearly revealed in the Levitical prophetic calendar, Leviticus chapter 23. The willful king of the world. And this is uh, still in chapter 11, uh, verse 36 through 45, of which we've already read. The personal Antichrist is called the willful king. He first pushes himself upward until he becomes the president of the United States of Europe, the beast kingdom, and according to the book of Revelation, chapter 6, he presents a program of peace to the world through a world government and uh, federation of all the nations of the earth under his rule. He is a willful king in every respect. And the king shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god. Daniel 11, 36. Now, these statements have reference to the Antichrist after he has been elevated as president of the United States of the world directly in the middle of the seven years. All power will be in his hands, even uh, as an absolute monarch like Nebuchadnezzar was over the kingdom of Babylon only a thousand times greater. And uh, Dr. Finus Jennings Dake in his notes teaches that the Antichrist will not have a worldwide kingdom. It will be centered around Palestine and that country over there in Israel. Uh, only the Lord really knows for sure about all of that. The willful nature of the Antichrist will be manifest from the very beginning of his career several years before he becomes ruler over all the world. The ten nations that make up the beast kingdom where their kings and government officials agree to give all of their power over to this willful king. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. Revelation 17 verse 12 and 13. The prophecies of Revelation agree fully with those in the book of Daniel. There is a growing trend and demand for a centralized world authority and this will continue until all the political power in the world will be vested in this one man. His word and decrees will be honored because all lesser authorities will fear him. The Antichrist will be the only God whom anyone will be permitted to worship during the last half of the tribulation period. All who refuse to worship him will be honored an automatic sentence of death. Uh, Revelation chapter uh, chapter 13 verse 13 through 17 which we're going to read. Revelation 13 verse 13 through 17 and I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth and this is verse 11 by the way another beast coming up out of the earth and he had two horns like a lamb and spake as a dragon and he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him and causeth the earth and them that dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed and he doeth great wonders so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And this is the image of the Antichrist. And he deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the beast, the image of the beast should be killed. And he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. And here is wisdom, let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred, three score and six. And this is Revelation 13, verse 11 through 18. Hallelujah. He exalts himself. And magnifies himself above every god. This includes the God of heaven. Daniel says that he blasphemes the God of heaven. 
In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4, Paul states that he opposes and exalted himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. All scripture regarding the character and nature of the Antichrist agree on this. The blasphemous vile king. Verse 36 again states that he shall speak marvelous things against the God of gods, and shall prosper until the indignation be accomplished, for that that is determined shall be done. The word marvelous as used here means surprise and astonishment. He will say such appalling things against the eternal God such as have never been uttered that people will be amazed. His utterances against God will be vulgar and vile in the extreme as only the son of the devil will be able to uh, capable of conceiving. These blasphemies will not be given on special occasions but they will be used in common conversation. Uh, same blasphemies will be taken upon the lips of the multitudes who will have taken the mark of the beast, for he is their ideal in everything. In the seventh chapter, uh, mention is made of the voice of the great words which the horn spake. These are words against the Ancient of Days. These blasphemies will not end when he is captured and flung into the lake of fire, but they will never again be heard by mortal ears. The Antichrist will prosper until the indignation be accomplished. This refers to the full period of the Great Tribulation with divine judgment bring, being poured upon the people which are a manifestation of God's wrath against sin. The last clause for that which is determined shall be done is an affirmation of God's prophetic revelations as recorded in the Bible. All prophecy will come to, to, to the very letter. Verse 37 is a repetition of what was in verse 36 with just a little addition, neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any God, for he shall magnify himself above all. This verse is a strong indication that the Antichrist will be a homosexual, one of the most vile and debasing sexual deviations, a practice which is becoming notorious in this end time. This characterized the people of Sodom and Gomorrah, upon whom God rained fire and brimstone, and destroyed them all. The fires of judgment in the tribulation period and at Armageddon at the return of Christ will likewise put an end to the Antichrist and all who worship and follow him. Political and military programs, verse 38 and 39, show that the Antichrist will honor the God of forces or the military God. This is another revelation of the self-will of this world dictator. The Jews will build their temple and renew their daily sacrifices by his permission at the beginning of his career. The daily sacrifices offered in this temple are an acknowledgment of Almighty God, but by force of arms these sacrifices are stopped and the temple is polluted. And the Holy Land will be partitioned, or he shall divide the land for gain. In verses 40 through 43 is an account of the final struggles of the Antichrist to maintain unity in the members of the Beast Kingdom. In Daniel chapter 7, three of the ten nations who make up the Beast Kingdom attempt to secede from the Federation, but the little horn or the personal Antichrist pluck them up by the roots. He makes them answerable to himself, even though he may leave their thrones intact. It appears that all through the tribulation he will have trouble with them, like Russia has had trouble with Hungary and Czechoslovakia. They will have to be held. Uh, they will have to be held under. The beast kingdom is represented in Daniel chapter two as being composed of iron and clay, two elements that will not adhere one to the other. That is why the coming United States of Europe and the United States of the world cannot last long. The main cause, however, is that God will fight against them to deliver the kingdoms of this world out of the hands of the devil and give them over to Jesus Christ and to his saints who are alone qualified to rule over Adam's fallen race and prepare them for and bring them into the possession of the new heavens and the new earth. Verses 44 and 45 are very significant. But tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. Therefore he shall go forth with great fury to destroy and utterly to make away many. And he shall plant the tabernacles of his palaces between the seas and the glorious holy mountain, yet he shall come to his end, and none shall help him. Just before these two verses are fulfilled and the destruction of the Antichrist at Armageddon, he will be occupied with troubles in Egypt, Libya, and Ethiopia, all located in northern Africa. It is after or at the time of the Antichrist is successfully dealing with this situation that those tidings out of the north East trouble him. The question arises, what are these tidings? For the answer, we will have to look 
at other prophecies that will make the answer clear. The cause of Armageddon. When the Antichrist, uh, the white horse rider of Revelation chapter 6, goes forth by the other apocalyptic horses, he succeeds in the formation of the United States of the world. One of the proposed cons uh, constitutional clauses is that if any nation attempts to secede from the Federation, all the other nations must, must make war against that nation and completely annihilate every individual in it. In the very end of the seven-year period of tribulation, the Jews will rebel against the Antichrist, cast his image, the abomination that make it desolate out of the temple, and proceed to cleanse it ceremonially. This is given in chapter 12. It is the tidings of this rebellion that makes the Antichrist uh, with great fury to utterly make away many. It is at this time that Satan will come to the aid of the Antichrist, as stated in Revelation 16, verse 3, and verse 14 and 16. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils, working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world, to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. And he gathered them together in a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon, the heavenly army. God has one purpose in this gathering of world armies, and the Antichrist has quite another. The gathering of the world's fighting forces to Armageddon and the battle itself will take a period of 75 days. The purpose of the Antichrist is to make away many and to put an end to the Jewish rebellion. But these armies are gathered and have taken Jerusalem and accomplished some destruction. The Ancient of Days appears visibly in the heavens, seated upon his judgment throne, accompanied by a myriad of angels, as seen in Daniel chapter 7, verse 9 through 14, which read, Zechariah 14, 1 through 3, uh, says that, his, that Jesus Christ is going to come back and the city is going to be divided and spoiled in the midst of the and so forth, the women ravished, and half of the city be taken. And then in Daniel chapter 7, verse 9 through 14, he speaks of, uh, he said, I saw that I uh, beheld the thrones were cast down, which is the Antichrist thrones in the ancient of days. He had set who is Jesus Christ, and uh, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like the pure wool. His uh, throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand, thousand ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set, and the books were open. So you see that when this thing happens, the, the devil will probably have something else in mind, like this writer says, but God will have something differently in mind because he's going to deliver Israel out of the hands of the Antichrist. This is followed by the appearance of Christ riding on a white horse, is followed by the armies of heaven clothed in fine linen, white and clean, and all the holy angels. Revelation 19, verse 11 through 21. Faced with this heavenly army, the Antichrist forgets his purpose of annihilating the Jews and turns to fight against Christ. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that had worshipped his image, these both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning, burning with brimstone, and the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. Revelation 19, verse 19 through 21. Daniel states very simply, He shall come to his end, and none shall help him. But such a display of divine power as described by John on Patmos, how could there be any human or even satanic help? Not only would human aid be impossible, but Satan and all his hosts will be completely powerless. How glad we should be that Christ is coming for his bride and all the redeemed hosts. This age is ending now, and all of the prophecies are coming to complete fulfillment in our generation. The judgments described in the book of Revelation will be poured out on the earth in this uh, lifetime. Uh, in this we rejoice. It is now that we should look up and lift up our heads for our redemption draweth nigh. The earth and the elect remnant that are left to go into the kingdom age will soon forget the sufferings of these end times in the joy and presence of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And so ends chapter 11 of the book of Daniel. We're going to get into chapter 12 here. Uh, the Great Tribulation of the last three and one half years of the 70th week of Daniel, the translation of the 144,000, Revelation 7, verse 1 through 8, 12 through 5, uh, 12, verse 5 of Revelation in chapter 14, verse 1 through 5. 
And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of troubles such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time, and at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book, in the resurrection. Uh, John 5, verse 28 and 29, Revelation 20, verse 4 through 6, 1 Corinthians 15. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars for ever and ever. But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words, and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. And I, Daniel, looked, and behold, there stood other two, the one on this side of the river, and the other on that side of the bank of the river. And one said to the one, to the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, How long shall it be to the end of these wonders? The answer, which is three and one half years of tribulation, Matthew 24, 15 through 22, Revelation 13. And I heard the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, when he held up his right hand and his left hand unto heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever, that it shall be for a time, and times, and half a time, and when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. And I heard, but I understood not. Then said I, O my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? The answer to additional periods following three and one half years. And he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Many shall be purified and made white, and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. And from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away, and the de abomination that make it desolate uh, set up, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. And blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the uh, to the thousand three hundred and five and thirty days. But go thou way, go thou thy way, till the end be. For thou shalt rest and stand in thy lot at the end of days of the days. Glory to God. The great tribulation. At that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince, which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble such was never since there was a nation, even to that same time, and at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. Verse one. Now this time of trouble of tribulation which occurs at the end of the church age is divided into three periods. The first, Jesus called the beginning of sorrows, Matthew 24, verse 7 and 8. He said, well, nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And uh, these are the beginning of sorrows. That war, uh, that began with the first world war, the rise of nation against nation, followed by famine, pestilences, and earthquakes in places where they had never had them before. And is constantly increasing in number. The beginning of sorrows will continue until the first revelation of the man of sin. He will be revealed to the saints by the confirmation of the Abrahamic covenant uh, with Israel in Daniel 9:27. The second division is often called the covenant week of Daniel and is that period of seven years in which the first resurrection will be completed, ending with the resurrection of all the tribulation martyrs in Revelation 20, verse 4 and 5. The third period is the Great Tribulation and begins directly in the middle of the seven years when the true identity of the Antichrist is revealed to the Jews and to the world, for it is at this time when he will sit in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God, according to 2 Thessalonians uh, 2, verse 4. From this event to the end of the Tribulation will be 42 months, the time given in Revelation 13 for the reign of the Antichrist over the entire world. War in heaven, the dragon is cast out. Revelation chapter 12 reveals the events that occur from the middle of the seven years through to the return of Christ in glory. It is at the beginning of the third division of the tribulation that Michael, one of the most powerful archangels, shall stand up. John the Revelator gives us a perfectly clear picture of what will happen. He said, And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world, he was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Revelation 12, verse 7 through 9. Paul calls Satan the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, in Ephesians 2, verse 2. 
Uh, he has access to this earth and is the accuser of our brethren, yet this is not his abode, for the earth was given to, by God to Adam's race. Satan was cast out of heaven when he fell along with all the angels who sided with him in his rebellion. They therefore inhabit the regions of space and possibly our entire galaxy which is contaminated by his presence. When God makes all things new after earth's great week of history, 7,000 years, has run its course and before the new heaven and the new earth are created, all that appear in these present heavenlies uh, heaven shall depart as a scroll when it is rolled together, according to Revelation 6.14. The writer of this book of Hebrews uh, is quoted, the inspired writing of the past said, Thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of thine hands. They shall perish, but thou remainest, and they shall uh, all wax old as doth a garment, and as a vesture thou shalt fold them up, and they shall be changed. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 10 through 12. Everything that has been contaminated by sin and the devil would be refined by fire and made new. Not only does the psalmist make mention of a new heaven and new earth, but Isaiah, the mouthpiece of God, says, All the host of heaven shall be dissolved, and the heavens shall be rolled together as a scroll. Uh, Isaiah 34, verse 4. For as the new heavens and the new earth which I will make shall remain before me, saith the Lord, so shall your seed and your name remain. Isaiah 66, 22. After the rapture of the Bride of Christ described in Revelation chapter 4, there will be war in heaven. Michael and his angels will fight against the devil and his angels, and they will be cast out into the earth, where they will be confined for the last three and one half years of the seven-year covenant week. This will be at the end of Satan's power to accuse God's people before him. It will be the greatest victory for God's people since Calvary, and that victory will come because of Calvary. When Satan and his angels are cast out into the earth, we hear the heavenly announcement. Now has come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ for the accuser of our brethren is cast down. He accused them before our God day and night. Revelation 12 verse 10. Lucifer is a powerful created being, perhaps the most powerful of all of the archangels. His beauty is described in the figure of, of Tyra. There is nothing said about him that is uh, in that description giving in Ezekiel chapter 28 verse 11 through 15 about his power yet even in his fallen state he has great power as can be realized uh, yet his power is limited and Michael is able to vanquish Satan and his angels and confine them to and their activities to the small planet where the battle between sin and righteousness is being fought to the finish. Now I'd like to turn to Ezekiel chapter 28 which is just before this, and I'd like to read you the description of this being that uh, we're going to be, that we're wrestling against today. Ezekiel 28, starting in verse 11 through 19. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardis, topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship of thy tablets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created till iniquity was found in thee. By the multitude of thy merchandise they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God, and will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings, that they may behold thee. Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities, by the iniquity of thy traffic. Therefore I will, will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee, and it shall devour thee, and I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. And all they that know thee among the people shall be astonished at thee, and thou shalt be a terror, and shall, uh, thou shalt, and shall never be any more. So you see... God is going to cast the devil down as far as the earth. Come on down here to the planet, and they're right in the directly in the middle of the tribulation. He has still access to the heavens now, 
and he has power, but when God gets through with him, he's not going to have anything but fire. And Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12 through 14, speaks of him as the light bearer. Uh, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nation? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. And I, I just wonder, in all honesty, as I sit here and I contemplate these verses, how could anyone who lived in the very presence of the great Jehovah God himself, created without any sin, perfect in all his ways, the great anointed cherubim, how could they willfully rebel and want to take over the throne of God? I don't think I quite understand that. Maybe one of these days when uh, I get raptured to heaven and get a glorified body and get to be with Jesus Christ for eternity, God will help me to understand why that such a glorified a glorious being, rather, anointed cherub with all those beautiful stones, willfully turned his back upon God to be cast only into a lake of fire to be burned for eternity. I don't think I quite understand that. Praise God. But I appreciate God bringing me out of darkness into his marvelous light. The meaning of the name Michael is who is like God. He is called, he is God's heavenly general and is also called the great prince who stands for the children of thy people, that is, Daniel's people, the Jews, through all generations. Everywhere we read of Michael in the Bible, he is contending with the devil. In Jude, he is contending with the devil over the body of Moses. And Daniel, he comes to assist a messenger angel against the satanic prince of Persia. In each instance, it is always with Israel or Daniel's people. However, the benefits of these battles against the forces of darkness and their Leader Satan are equally shared by all Christian believers, for we are the seed of Abraham by faith, according to Galatians chapter 3, verse 26 through 29. The last three and one half years of this age, when the personal Antichrist is given all power and authority by the devil to work his will in the battle of, against Christ and Christians, will be the most uh, severe part of the end time trouble. trouble. Daniel says that there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. Jesus, referring to the same time, said, Such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be, in Matthew 24, 21. It is during this full three and one half years that Satan and myriads of his angels will be confined to the earth among men. John said, Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time, Revelation 12, verse 12. This language indicates that Satan and these trillions of fallen angels will possess humanity in such a way that will bring much torment. All those who refuse the mark of the beast will be mar martyred or tortured to death by satanically invented means. Millions will be martyred during the tribulation period. In this first verse, Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, we also have the statement, And at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. If we stay close to the sense of the statements in this verse, we must confine ourselves to the last three and one half years of the seven year tribulation, for it is then that Michael stands up. That war in heaven may not last long as we count time, for God through his great archangel has power to vanquish Satan and all his hosts in a moment. If the war in heaven will commence at the beginning of the seven years, it could have reached its climax directly in the middle of the tribulation, for Revelation 12 makes it clear that Satan and his angels are cast out into the earth at the same time. That's what Ezekiel said here. He said, I will, uh, Ezekiel chapter 28 and uh, verse uh, 17 says, I will cast thee to the ground and I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. Glory to God. Thank God. Hallelujah. Praise God. So you see that devil's going to be cast out. The saints are going to be delivered. If by that people is meant all the redeemed whose names are in the book of life, then this resurrection would conclude the bride of Christ in Revelation 4, the innumerable company in Revelation 7, and the 144,000 sealed ones of Israel in Revelation 12, and in 14, 1 through 5, and the harvest of the earth, Revelation 14. Verse 2 of Daniel 12 seems to include the resurrection of life eternal of all true believers, both Jew and Gentile. And many of them that sleep are 
or which are dead in Christ, in the dust of the earth shall awake some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Now, this cannot be a statement referring to a general resurrection of both saint and sinner, for the scripture never contradicts itself. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. Revelation 20 verse 5. This should not be confusing because there are two of the wicked resurrected during this time, the beast and the false prophet, for at the end of the tribulation they are cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. You will also notice that the verse regarding the resurrection is not all inclusive for it states that many who sleep in the dust shall awake. At the final resurrection, at the time of the great quiet throne judgment, John said that he saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. Uh, Revelation 20 verse 12. Now, this is all inclusive. The book of the Revelation gives us the scenes in heaven of each uh, of the resurrection orders. Re the righteous, the reward of the righteous. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. This is in verse 3. This is a promise made of the reward at the time of their first resurrection. This resurrection is fulfilled completely, uh, fully complete at the resurrection of revelation of Jesus Christ when all the saved of all ages will be in their glorified bodies. By that time, the uh, influences of every individual over the lives of people will have accomplished all that will ever be achieved. The coming of the Lord, uh, therefore, will be the time we receive our eternal reward. Revelation 22:12. Whatever, whatever has been accomplished through our acts of righteousness for his, whole, for his glory alone will be reflected in our glorified bodies. The righteous will shine as the brightness of the firmament. The righteous takes in every uh, person that's filled with the great Holy Ghost baptism, speak with tongues, and are baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Now every saint will shine with the same brightness and glory, for Paul said there is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the of the stars, for one star differeth from another in glory, so also is the resurrection of the dead. First Corinthians 15, verse 40 and 40, 41 and 42. The more we seek and obtain the salvation of souls, the greater will be our reward, and the more brilliantly we will shine in God's heaven. They that turn many to righteousness uh, will shine as the stars forever and ever. You do not have to be a preacher to win souls to Christ. Any layman can be. Uh, able to win souls by prayer, personal testimony, tract distribution, personal work, and other means. Every believer should be a soul winner because this will determine your brightness among the eternal stars. His glorified saints. The word shall is very positive. Therefore, we should make full use of our time and talent so we will be among the brightest of stars. He that winneth souls is wise. This glory and brightness will be for all eternity. God's last message to Daniel. But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. Verse 4. The book of Daniel was to be a sealed book until the time of the end. It is definitely the book uh, revealing the entire times of the Gentiles. The times of the Gentiles are the years that Jews as a people would remain under the governments of other nations, and that would be for 2,520 years as punishment for the returning, their turning to idolatry. Leviticus chapter 26, verse 18, 21, 24, 28. The times of the Gentiles, Luke 21, 24, began to close during the First World War when Palestine was taken away from the Turkish people and given back to the Jews as a national homeland under the Balfour Declaration. In 1948, Israel became a nation. In 1967, Old Jerusalem was taken by the Jews. What will happen uh, in the 2000s? <laughs> The Antichrist will confirm the covenant with Israel for a period of seven years, 2,520 days. 75 days after that, Christ will come in the clouds of heaven to rescue the besieged city and set the remnant of the Jews and the remnant of the Jews and will set up his millennial kingdom. Prophecy is easier comprehended after it becomes history. The great kingdoms of Babylon, Medo Persia, uh, Greece, Rome, uh, Egypt, and Assyria are all history, and we understand better the meaning of the image to Daniel chapter 2 the feet and toes of the image are becoming quite clear now even though it is not yet history because we are living in the time of the end we know that there is to be a beast kingdom composed of ten nations within the boundary of the old Roman Empire we know that has been planned for and talked about for the many years and they call it the United States of Europe 
We are living close enough to the towns, uh, to the full times of the Gentiles, to comprehend all the prophecies of these last days. Multitudes of good people are blind to what is going on because they are not interested enough in Bible prophecy and the coming of Jesus to care. They are making good money and living in luxury and planning on a great future. Like Nero, they fiddle while Rome burns. They slumber and sleep prophetically and spiritually on the threshold of the Great Tribulation. Luke 21:35. We are in the time of the end, and everything we find in the book of Daniel can be understood. A German translation of this verse means, Many shall run across them, and great knowledge find. Daniel is an open book today to all those who seek its knowledge. We know we are living in the time of the end, for there never has been so many running to and fro. While I was in one New York airport, I was told that they have to process 90,000 people per day. Millions are flying, and they are constantly building larger and faster airplanes. Planes, boats, cars, and buses are crowded. We are now conquering space and can go to the moon and back in a few days. Tomorrow, it will be the another planet's if Jesus tarries. All of these new inventions by our scientists to facilitate travel and knowledge are signs of Jesus' near coming and that the end of the age is upon us. Schools are also crowded around the world, although the communists have thrown the hammer and sickle into the cogs of the machinery to slow it down. Daniel chapter 12, verse 5 through 13, the remainder of this book. The calendar event for the duration of the tribulation. Then I, Daniel, beheld, looked, and behold, there stood other two, the one on this side of the bank of the river, and the other on that side of the bank of the river. And one said to the man clothed in linen, which was up on the waters of the river, How long shall it be to the end of these wonders? And I heard the man clothed in linen, which was up on the waters of the river, when he held up his right hand and his left hand into heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever, that it shall be for a time, and times, and half a time, and what he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. Uh, Daniel 12, verse 5 through 7. These two uh, men clothed with linen are angels. The question is asked by one of the angels, How long shall it be to the end of these wonders? This was the great question in the mind of Daniel, and the answer to which the Spirit of God wanted us to, in our generation to know. Bible prophecy concerning the people who are living in the last days when all prophecy will be brought to consummation is vital to us because we are among these people. The other angel held up both hands to heaven like that which is done in our courts when one hand is uh, when, with one hand when the witness is being given an oath. He declared by him that liveth forever and ever that the end would come in three and one half years. This is the length of the time of the personal antichrist shall reign over the whole earth as described in Revelation 13. The scattering or breaking up the power of this holy people is accomplished during the reign of the personal Antichrist who will not tolerate the worship of any god but himself. John said that all must worship him and receive the mark of the beast or die. In this three and one half years the one world church is used by the Antichrist to force all people to worship him. It is during this period the breaking up of the power of the Christian Jew and Gentile is uh, is completed as we have seen in Daniel 7:21. The Antichrist makes war over the saints and prevails against them until the Ancient of Days come, and all these things will be finished. Daniel was like a great many of us in understanding the three and one half years. In our day, we should have no difficulty, for we see by the book of the Revelation that it is 42 months, the exact time of the reign of the Antichrist over a world federation of nations. Daniel said, I heard, but I understood not. Uh, then he is encouraged to ask the question, O oh my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? The question went unheeded, for it was not for Daniel to know, since he was so far be removed from the end of the times of the Gentiles. Then the angel said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed until the time of the end. And we are now in the time of the end, and the book of Daniel is not closed or sealed up to us in this generation. Daniel and Revelation are wide open and can be understood. The saints purified and tried. Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. Daniel 12, verse 10. Between the time of Daniel and the return of Christ in glory, many have been and are being purified in heart. Heart purity is an act of God and can be obtained in this life by faith. It is encouraging to know that the many will be purified. 
uh, they will be made white. White is a symbol of purity in intimating a process of spiritual development or advancement by testing and trials as a whitening process. It is a purified who are made white. Perfect submission to God always hastens the process. Many also will be tried. The testing of the saints is necessary. Some seem to go through greater trials and testings than others, but that is needed to make them the finished products God wants. These last days are times of great testings, and we need to be faithful, praying much for God's grace and assistance, and He's always ready there to help us. The increase in wickedness. But the wicked shall do wickedly. Uh, it is a very significant statement and fits the conditions in our times. It corresponds to the statement in the New Testament, but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. 2 Timothy chapter 3. The wickedness of this generation is worse than any generation in the world that has ever lived. The antediluvians were not excluded. And Paul says that it will continue to become worse. There seems to be a natural meant in most people to take the way of unrestrained evil propensities. In the antediluvian days, God said, My spirit shall not always die with man. His mercy waited for 120 years while Noah was building the ark, but there was no revival, no return to God, because they had gone too far in their wickedness and open rebellion against God. This generation is in exactly the same condition now. And I'd like to correct that statement there. Um, when he said, uh, his days shall be 120 years, my spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh. Um, uh, one of Noah's sons was only 100 years old, two years after the flood. And when God spoke to Noah to bring yourself, your wife, and your sons and their wives into the ark, the sons were married at the time that uh, God told them to build an ark and so forth. And two years after the flood, uh, one of his sons was only 100 years old, so it couldn't have taken him 120 years to build the ark, as this uh, people you know, used to take that scripture in that context or that light, which is not true. The restraining influence of the Spirit was withdrawn gradually in Noah's day. The restraint against wickedness today is being gradually taken away. That is why we have so much vice and crime. Lawlessness is at an all-time high, and with rioting strikes and bold murder on every uh, uh, corner, we are seeing the very fulfillment of these prophecies. This increase in wickedness was to come in the last days when the wicked would become more wicked as a result of less restraint against sin. Now the Holy Ghost, is, being God, will never be taken out of the world during the tribulation, but he will be and is gradually being taken out of the way. A Christian with any degree of spiritual perception can see that evil men and seducers are becoming worse and worse. All this wickedness shall exist in the last days as a sign of Jesus' near coming. None of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. None in, is comprehensive. None of our rulers, politicians, apostate church leaders have the slightest idea that they are the tools of Satan to bring into existence and promote the program of the personal antichrist and that they are actually in rebellion against God just as much as or more than they were in the leaders in the days of Noah. Uh, they do not understand their position in this end time panorama, uh, nor is any able to get the truth of the Bible prophecy to them. Not only they do not understand, but they do not want to understand. Multitudes of religious people today are supporting and fervently promoting the programs of the Antichrist, which are now in process of organization. These people also have to be classed with the wicked and who do not understand, but the wise shall understand. Since the Bible makes such a distinct line of demarcation between those two classes of people, the wise and the wicked, I'm going to stick to the Bible. If you do not understand, you are among the wicked. If you do understand, then you are one of the wise. Christ said that it is God who makes one blind because of sin, unbelief, and self-will, or opens the eye because of faith, obedience, and surrender. The closing days of tribulation. And from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away, and the abomination that make a desolate set up, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. Here we have some other dates in the 2520-day tribulation calendar, and it is very simply stated so that all the wise can understand. The starting point in this chronology of prophecy is uh, the taking away of the daily sacrifice. These sacrifices will begin after the building of the tribulation temple in Jerusalem and the instituting of the Levitical sacrifices. This will occur after the Antichrist has confirmed the 
Abrahamic covenant with Israel on the first day of the 2520 days of the covenant week of Daniel. And it is directly in the middle of the week that the Antichrist overthrows or causes the daily sacrifice to cease, Daniel 9, 27. And instead of these sacrifices and oblations, the Antichrist sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God, 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 4. An image made of the Antichrist was set up in the temple in the place of his person, and this is the abomination that make it desolate, to which Jesus referred to in his Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24, 15. Therefore, from this act to the very end of the 2,520 days of the covenant week, to the last day of that period of tribulation will be 1,260 days, the last half of the tribulation. But this, very, but this verse brings us a, to a period of 30 days beyond the tribulation, or 1,290 days from the setting up of the image of the Antichrist in the temple. And we have seen in an earlier chapter in Daniel 8, 13 through 14, that the time from the institution of the daily sacrifices to the end of the tribulation is exactly 2,300 days, at the end of which the temple is cleansed of this image by the Antichrist. This prophecy of 1,290 days therefore reveals to us the length of time it will take for the armies of the Antichrist to assemble in the Valley of Megiddo, namely 30 days. Zealous Jews will cast the image out of the temple with the purpose of cleansing it ceremonially and commencing again the sacrifices to the Lord, but this is prevented by the gathering of all nations uh, to the battle of Armageddon. We're going to read that in Zechariah chapter 12, uh, verse 2 through 4, and also chapter 14, verse 1 through 3, or 1 through 5, or whatever. The burden of the word of the Lord for Israel, saith the Lord, which stretcheth forth the heavens and layeth the foundations of the earth, and would formeth the spirit of man within him. Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling unto all the people round about, when they shall be in the siege, both against Judah and against Jerusalem. And in that day will I make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. All that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces, though all the people of the earth be gathered together against it. And then uh, Zechariah 14, 1 through 3. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and thy spoil, talking about Israel here, shall be divided in the midst of thee. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished. And half of the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. And that's when uh, his feet are going to come back, and uh, he's going to come back, and his feet are going to stand at the mount up on the Mount of Olives. Glory to God. Verse 12, Blessed is he that waiteth and cometh through the thousand three hundred and five and thirty days, which is thirteen hundred and thirty-five days. This is seventy-five days, thirty plus forty-five days, beyond the complete end of the seven-year period to the time of blessedness. During that period of forty-five days will be fought the battle of Armageddon when these armies of the nations turn their attention to the crowned and victorious Christ on his white horse. They will actually attempt to fight against Christ and his glorified saints. Revelation uh, chapter 19, uh, verse 11 through 21, which we will read, we have read before, and we'll read again, because it is this particular battle here, when Israel is snatched out of the hands of the Antichrist, and the world is snatched out of the hands of the devil and the Antichrist, and God's people will have a chance then to live for a thousand years on this earth, reigning over the twelve tribes of Israel and the nations of the earth with the twelve apostles and David, King David, and also the glorified, in their glorified bodies and in the natural, uh, there will be people here that escape the tribulation judgments and will go into the thousand year millennial reign in the flesh. Uh, Revelation 19, verse 11, I saw heaven open, and behold a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. He was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And this is uh, uh, the saints of God, if we make it as part of the, in, you know, the bride of Christ in the rapture. We're going to come back with Jesus Christ. And the, out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. 
And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that ye may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains, and the flesh of mighty men, and the flesh of horses, and of them that sit on them, and the a flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. And then he says, I saw the beasts and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worship his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone, and the remnant were slain with the sword of him that set upon the horse which sore proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. And uh, in Zechariah we read uh, for that he would make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people, all the people of the earth, uh, even though all the people of the world are gathered together against it, yet they will be cut in pieces. And uh, according to Revelation 19, 11 through 21, uh, we see that all these fowls in the midst of heaven, all these different buzzards and birds and whatever, God calls these to eat these, uh, pick the bones and pick the flesh off of the people that come against him uh, at the Battle of Armageddon. And we're going to read about that uh, back in Zechariah chapter 12, and we're going to read starting at verse 4. In that day, saith the Lord, I will smite every horse with astonishment and his rider with madness. And I will open my eyes upon the house of Judah and will smite every horse of the people with blindness. And the governors of Judah shall say in their heart, the inhabitants of Jerusalem shall be the strength, be my strength and the Lord of hosts their God. In that day will I make the governors of Judah like an hearth of fire among the wood and like a torch of fire in a sheep. And they shall devour all the people round about on the right and on the left, and Jerusalem shall be inhabited again in her own place, even in Jerusalem. The Lord also shall wave the tents of Judah, or I'm sorry, shall save the tents of Judah, first that the glory of the house of David and the glory of the inhabitants of Jerusalem do not magnify themselves against Judah. In that day shall the Lord defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and he that is feeble among them at that day shall be as David, and the house of David shall be as God, as the angel of the Lord before them, and it shall come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem to battle. And then he says, And I will pour upon the house of David, and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and of supplication. And they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one is in bitterness for his firstborn. And in that day there shall be a great mourning in Jerusalem as the mourning of Hadad Rimmon in the valley of Megiddo. And the land shall mourn every family apart, the family of the house of David apart and their wives apart, the family of the house of Nathan apart and their wives apart, the family of the house of Levi apart and their wives apart, the family of Shimei apart and their wives apart, and all the families that remain, every family apart and their wives apart. And then in verse uh, chapter 13, verse 1, in that day there shall be a fountain open to the house of David and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanness. And then of course in verse 6, And one shall, shall, answer, shall say unto him, What are these wounds in thine hands? Then he shall answer those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. So you see, uh, God is going to save Israel out of the hands of the Antichrist. And I read you those scriptures. I'd like to read you another parallel scripture in the book of Isaiah chapter 63. It's a very beautiful scripture where that God comes back after fighting this great battle. And uh, he means business, church. Glory to God. Eloko Manisha, Kabbalah Sadira. Who is this that cometh from Edom with dyed garments from Basra? This that is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength. And then God answers and says, I that speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Wherefore art thou red in thine apparel, and thy garments like him that treadeth in the wine fat? I have trodden the wine press alone, and of the people there was none with me. For I will tread them in my anger, and trample them in my fury. And their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments, and I will stain all my raiment. For the day of vengeance is in my heart, and the year of my redeemed is come. 
And I looked that there was none to help, and I wondered that there was none to uphold. Therefore my own arm brought salvation unto me, in my fury it upheld me. And I will tread down the people in my anger, and make them drunk in my fury. And I will bring down their strength to the earth. Glory to God. You see there that God's coming back, and he's going to snatch the people of God out of the hands of the Antichrist, and cast the devil, the false prophet, and to put the false prophet in the... In the Antichrist himself into the lake of fire for eternity and put the devil in the bottomless pit for uh, uh, the la for a thousand years. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, they would actually fight against Christ up on his white horse. And, of course, <laughs> as we've seen through these scriptures right here, it's not going to do him any good to fight against the great Jesus Christ as he comes out of heaven on his white horse with all of his saints. He's going to stain all of his clothes with the blood and trample him in his fury. According to Revelation chapter 14, verse 8, I mean, chapter 14, yeah, verse 18 through 20, it says, And another angel came out of the temple which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar which had power over fire, and cried with a loud cry to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sharp sickle, and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden without the city and blood came out of the winepress even unto the horse bridles by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs or about approximately two hundred miles. Thank God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Multitudes will be slain who are not in that uh, army. They will be killed by the last great global earthquake in which every wall shall fall to the ground and every wall and every skyscraper and home in the world will fall to the ground. Revelation chapter 16 verse 17 through 20. Listen to this. Glory to God. And the seventh angel poured out his vial unto the air and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying it is done. This talent weighs about 114 pounds apiece. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such as was not since men were upon the earth so mighty an earthquake and so great. And the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell, and great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found, and there fell upon the upon men a great hail out of heaven every stone about the weight of a talent and men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail for the plague thereof was exceeding great according to this gentleman here Mr. Finest Jennings Dake that's about 114 pounds could you imagine things like that falling out of heaven on the earth and hitting people on the head when, when it comes a great hail storm there's it beats cars up and butchers crops and everything like that or something weighing as much as 114 pounds falling out of heaven all that distance and hitting people on the head it will be major destruction and that's exactly what's going to happen in the book of revelation i'm going to turn to revelation chapter 6 verse 12 through 17 and see exact parallel of what's happening here and when and i beheld when he had opened the sixth seal and lo there was a great earthquake and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us. And hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath has come, and who shall be able to stand? I'd like to turn to Ezekiel chapter uh, 39, verse 17 through 20, and give you a, a, another insight of this great earthquake. Ezekiel chapter 39, verse 17 through 20. Thank God. And thou, son of man, Thus saith the Lord God, Speak unto every feathered fowl. It's the same thing we read in Revelation chapter 19, verse 11 through 21 a while ago about the battle of Armageddon. 
and to every beast of the field, assemble yourselves and come and gather yourselves on every side to my sacrifice that I do sacrifice for you, even a great sacrifice upon the mountain of Israel, that ye may eat flesh and drink blood. Ye shall eat the flesh of the mighty men of the mighty and drink the blood of the princes of the earth, the rams of lambs and of goats, of bullocks, and of all the fatlings of Bashan, and ye shall eat till ye be full and drink blood till ye be drunken of my sacrifice which I have sacrificed for you. Thus ye shall be filled at my table with horses and chariots and mighty men with all men of war, saith the Lord God. Glory to God. You see, that's some powerful reading there. That's exactly what's going to happen. So if you don't have the baptism of the Holy Ghost, speaking with tongues, as the Spirit of God gives the utterance, and you don't believe in the great oneness of God, and you haven't been baptized in water in the name of Jesus Christ, my friend, I urge you, while it is time, to run to the rock of ages and hide yourself, as it were, for a moment until his indignation be overpassed. Because the only way that you and I will ever make it into the glorious world with the redeemed is if we repent of our sins and turn to God with our whole heart and be baptized in water in the name of Jesus Christ, not saying Father, Son, Holy Ghost as the traditional world people do. But do it like the apostles did it, because the name of Jesus Christ is a strong tower. The righteous runneth into it and are safe. And neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Whatsoever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. So we need to get baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, not to please the preacher, but the Bible says in Acts 2.38, it is for the remission of sins and the precious gift of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues is very vital to our soul. Glory to God. Ezekiel chapter 38, verse 20. So that the fishes of the sea and the fowls of the heaven and the beasts of the field and all creeping things that creep upon the earth and all the men that are upon the face of the earth shall shake at my presence and the mountain shall be thrown down and the steep places shall fall and every wall shall fall to the ground. Hallelujah. Some powerful reading. So great is the slaughter at Armageddon that will, that in the last gigantic earthquake, that this prophecy simply declares that blessed is he who is left alive to go into the millennial reign under Christ. The judgments of the nation, and rebel in Matthew chapter 25, verse 31 through 46, where Christ sits upon his throne, will bring to an end all who are not worthy and prepared among men to go into the glorious reign of Christ. The closing verse of this wonderful book is a consoling statement to Daniel, who was the prince of the prophets, the greatest faithful who ever lived, the greatest prayer, uh, prayer and devoted servant of God on record, a saint in deed and in truth. He was the only one whom the sacred record calls greatly beloved of God. To him God said, Go thou thy way till the end be, for thou shalt rest and stand in thy lot at the end of the days. As individuals, we shall stand in our lot at that uh, same time in our position in the glorious uh, kingdom to be according to our faithfulness to God and to all things during our life on this earth from the time God saved us. Note the image of the Antichrist will speak, move, and appear life like according to Revelation 13, verse 15. Junior high and high school children in the United States are becoming, uh, being shown an educational film on computers in which the computer reproduces musical tones forming a melody. Each tone is given a number which is fed into the computer and produces its sound and the musical rhythm. Here could be the secret of the life likeness of the image and the voice of the Antichrist. A transistorized tape with a programmed computer could be used to simulate voice, lip, jaw, and facial movement. The blasphemies uttered by the lifelike image in the sacred temple will be unutterably abominable and desolating in the eyes of the faithful Jewish remnant. Yet his power will be so great that they will succeed only in mustering enough popular support to cast out the abominable image and cleanse the temple at or within a few days at the end of the 1260 day period, the act of which prompts the Antichrist to gather all the nations against the Jews at Armageddon. And uh, I'd like to say this, that the Bible says that the Antichrist and the false prophet both have power to pray fire down uh, from the earth, down upon the earth in the sight of men. 
and cause as many as would not worship the beast and so forth to be killed. So the Antichrist is uh, doesn't have to have a computer to do his work. It doesn't have to have a computer to you know to do his uh, speaking. And but the Bible said he, that the false prophet had power to give life. A computer don't have life, and he said that he had power to give life to the image of the beast. And in Pharaoh's time, and in Egypt down in Moses' days, when Moses and Aaron went in before Pharaoh and turned their uh, staves into snakes or serpents, uh, the Jannes and Jambres, the magicians of Egypt, actually did the same thing. When they turned the water to blood, Jannes and Jambres did the same thing. So it is not impossible for the devil to use people to uh, have power to actually do some literal miracles in these last days. Praying fire down from heaven. How many times have you or I, either one, seen people pray fire down from heaven? But this will actually happen during the tribulation period. And also I'd like to say this, that at the same time that the beast and the false prophet are doing all these miracles and deceiving people, uh, trying to deceive natural Israel, uh, and trying to cause them to receive the mark of the beast, and of course the rest of the world, uh, that at the same time, in the last three and one half years, uh, the Bible teaches that there will be two prophets that will also have the power to shut heaven, that it does not even rain in the days of their prophets, and uh, in their days of their prophecy, they are the prophets of God, and if any man tries to hurt them, fire proceeds out of their mouth and devours their enemies, and if any man tries to kill them, they must in this manner also be killed. So you see the uh, beast and the false prophet doing great miracles, praying fire down from heaven, and you see the two prophets of God, whether they be Enoch and Elijah, uh, or somebody, one of them will be Elijah, according to Malachi chapter 4, verse 5. But Enoch didn't die either. He went to heaven. He was not, for God took him, and he went to heaven without dying. So uh, he is very likely to be the, the uh, second witness along with Elijah in Revelation chapter 11. And I'd like to say that uh, at this time, this things, these things will be going on at the same time. So it's not like we have to go and find us a computer with, with binary logic and all the different types of computer language and all that to try to get uh, something that calls the people to worship it. I don't think that's the case at all. I think that, that people worship the devil because the devil is a spirit and, and they get some type of immoral satisfaction out of getting involved in their spirit realm. And I believe that's the reason why they'll worship the devil. Glory to God. But I believe that Jesus Christ is worthy to be worshipped for the devil is worthy to have exactly what happened to him uh, that's, that's going to happen to him in the last uh, uh, at the end of the tribulation and at the end of the thousand years he's going to be cast into the lake of fire forever and ever and ever glory to God I'd like to read you some scriptures here and uh, starting the image of, of Daniel and uh, so forth. Let me see if I can find you something here in uh, chapter 11. Uh, Dr. Dake is full of uh, Bible knowledge. A lot of the things we may not agree or may agree with. But, uh, he's definitely a very smart man or was. I'm grateful for his desire. Uh, I'd like to read you this excerpt here as much as our time will go out. Knowledge shall be increased. Daniel chapter 12 verse 4. M modern inventions are being referred to almost universally as fulfillment of the prophecy. The only verse in which this is true is by the fulfillment of Daniel 12 verse 4. Knowledge shall be increased. One can list all present or future inventions and all knowledge, the all increase of knowledge under this heading in a general way, but when it comes to finding every new invention in particular in Scripture, we immediately enter the realm of speculation and sensationalism and become unscriptural. It will be seen that such interpretations are fully out of harmony with the Bible. Now, here's some of the things here, and I, I don't want to, I, I say this sort of lightly because it's not really that important, but uh, I'd like to say this uh, anyway, that 22 modern fallacies. Automobiles. Nahum chapter 2 verse 3 and 4. The chariots here were horse-drawn ones in the battle between Nebuchadnezzar 
and the king of Nineveh about 16 BC as proved in Nahum 1 verse 1, 2 verse 13, 3 verse 1 through 3. If students reading uh, of the chariots that shall jostle one against another in the broad ways in Nahum 2 verse 4 would proceed to the next chapter in Nahum 3 verse 2 and read uh, about the noise of a whip and the sound of a rattling of the wheels and of the prancing horses and of the jumping chariots they would see the prophet Nahum had rattling chariots drawn by horses uh, spurred on by the whip in mind. The fact that the horsemen lifted up both the bright sword and the glittering spear in chapter 3 verse 3 of Nahum as well as the shield in chapter 2 verse 3 is the, in the sunlight to cause the chariot to seem like torches chapter 2 verse 4 flashing in the battle described should make it undeniable that the chariots that shall rage in the streets and run like the lightning are definitely not an automobile with their headlights the sun shining on the polished metal causing it to flash like a mirror is the idea and then of course the airplane is another invention that they say the seven uh, scriptures are said to predict it's the invention of the airplane as bird flying in Isaiah 31 5 instead of the airplane this refers to the second event of Christ when the Lord not General Allenby in 1917 will come to fight and deliver Jerusalem from the Antichrist as is clear from a reading of the whole chapter not one detail of verse 4 through 9 in chapter 31 verse 1 through 20 1 through 20 was fulfilled in 1917 at the Balfour Declaration. Right up on the high places of the earth, Isaiah 58:14. This is a figure of blessing in material things and not a reference to riding in airplanes. If planes are meant, then Israel had them, had them then when they came uh, out of Egypt, for the same figure is used in Deuteronomy 32, verse 13, chapter 33, verse 29. Um, these that fly as a cloud and as doves to their windows, Isaiah 60 verse 8. The reference here is to the return of Israel in ships on occasions to Palestine in the millennium, verse 9 through 22 are proof of this. And he shall fly as an eagle, Jeremiah 48 verse 40, 49 verse 22. This refers to Nebuchadnezzar conquering like an eagle, pouncing on his prey, Jeremiah 46, 13 and 26, 49 verse 30. Babylon is symbolized by a lion with eagle's wings in Daniel 7 verse 4. The idea is conquest as swift as an eagle, Deuteronomy 28 49. When God uh, bare Israel on eagle's wings out of Egypt, he did not, <laughs> had on, when God bore e uh, Israel on eagle's wings out of Egypt, did he use airplanes, Exodus 19 verse 4. Number 5, the wings straight. Ezekiel 1, verse 23 and 24, these are the wings of the cherubim, not airplanes. Ezekiel 1, 4 through 28 and 10, 1 through 22. And number 6, the goat that touched not the ground, Daniel 8, verse 5. This is plainly a symbol of Greece, not an airplane, according to Daniel 8, 21. The Chaldeans that fly as an eagle in Habakkuk 1, 8, the reference here, also to the swiftness of conquest on horses, as is clear in verse, the verse itself, see point 4 uh, above. Thank you for sharing with us the book of Daniel. Thank you, Lord. Our next study, by the way, we're going to get into probably the book of Revelation.